starting now. From Section 204, Heavy Hockey Podcast with Michael and Guess. Heavy Hockey isn't dead, it's just getting started. Hi, it's Michael here. I'm the host of the Heavy Hockey Podcast, bringing you another edition, this time with video and a new guest tonight. Uh, we're going to have Shane Sander with me from the Hockey Writers, and we'll talk more about that shortly. First, I want to uh, talk about the Oilers Live Cup, which is coming December 9th at the Downtown Community Arena in Edmonton. Uh, it starts at 2 p.m. Uh, the hockey game is 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. We're still short two skaters, so we've got room for two skaters. Of course, there's no registration fee, and all of the donations that anybody does will be going to the Chinook Autism Society. So that's a great... Uh, great place for it to go it uh, should help a lot of uh, a couple kids out at least uh, and then we're going to go to the hat um, uh, restaurant hat hat pub and uh, on jasper and we're going to have an after party there there's going to be some drink specials and everything else so lots of fans have already signed up we've got about uh, 30 to 50 fans uh, that'll be there cheering us guys out on uh, as we're um, on the ice, uh, Team Heavy Hockey versus Team Mega Thread. So, uh, now on to the show. We've got Shane Sander with us. He is the, he's one of the regular contributors at the Hockey Writers. Uh, you can find him at, uh, or anything he's written, at hockeywriters.com slash author slash S Sander. Welcome to the show, Shane. Hey, Mike. How's it going? It's going really well. Uh, actually had a uh, great day and as you and I had talked I am going to um, after this uh, going to go and record another uh, super pod with the uh, gents at uh, Oilers YYC so if uh, anybody that's listening to this right now they can go and maybe have a listen uh, to that later uh, tonight or today Shane you and I let's uh, chat about the Oilers uh, season preview you did an article uh, I want to say about a week ago now. Uh, the season preview? Yeah. Uh, the season preview was probably closer to the beginning of the month, I think, right? Or like two weeks ago? Yeah, about two weeks ago. Yeah. Just over two weeks ago, yeah. Okay, so a lot has happened since then. I have, uh, if you're, if for those watching on the video, I put up your uh, initial predictions in terms of who you thought would be in the lineup we've had some exhibition games since then a lot of surprises uh if you watched of course all of us watched last night lots changed last night even um let's talk about uh you had uh, on your season uh on your depth chart to start the season you had uh reader Pugliarvi, cassian going two three and four on the right wing uh, Hopkins, Lucic, Kajula on the left wing, and then Kara on the fourth line. Uh, you know what? Um, and then, of course, I mean, we had the usuals. Uh, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Ryan Strom, and Brodziak. What was in your thinking back then, uh, before the season started? How, what, you know, what did you have in mind as you, as you were building up the season preview there? So as we were building the lineup for the season preview, it was more so it was about finding pillars, right? So, you know, the obvious is that down the middle, they're going to go McDavid, Drysaddle, Strom, and Brodziak, right? Um, and then just trying to find the pairings of who was going to fit best with who. So when I went through and I was actually building the lineup, it was almost a foregone conclusion that Nugent Hopkins was going to start the year with McDavid. Um, they were very heavy and hard on the fact that they were still going to give Lucic a chance in the top six. So him and Dry Settle working together, that made that made some sense. And then you would see, you know, like, okay, well, what are they going to do with the bottom six now, right? So you know that Cassian's going to be there with Brodziak, and you're trying to find someone to play with Strom, and you saw that, you know, well, Perry Arby's got to actually be here. So where is he going to go? He's probably going to end up with Strom because that's where he, he played the most amount of minutes last year. Um, so, you know, you, you've got your pairings there. And then it was just about finding 
who was the right fit and what hole that they had here. Um, the, the obvious with uh, Ratty starting the year because, you know, as the rumblings went on, you know, it was just they're probably going to start the year back up with Ratty through all, all the interviews and everything that were done, and they kind of just tipped their hand in that direction. Um, when you're looking at Reader, you're trying to find someone that's, that's a decent fit. It was about having that forward that would fit in the middle six, that would be able to provide some scoring, would also be able to maybe play some PK time as well. So having him as a five-on-five line mate with Dreisaitl, someone that he's had some chemistry with in the past, that sort of made a nice little fit in the on the second line. And then it was just a matter of, well, where are you, who are you going to flip-flop around here with Kajula and Kara, right? So Kajula getting the $1.5 million contract that he got, it was clear that they wanted him to maybe play again once uh, in a, a top-nine role there on the third line as the left wing. And then Kara bumping down gave the Oilers and, you know, in at least in the thinking on, on paper was that they'd have a very heavy, but very fast, very hard hitting energy line on the fourth Mm -hmm. with Kara, Brodziak and Cassian. Well, now as time has changed, you know, it's like they they always say, you never really know until the games are played. (laughs) Well, you know, how, how much has reader really given in preseason? You know, he's been pretty quiet. Um, even Kajula, Kajula's, you know, been uh, almost invisible. Uh, same thing with Auberg right now, who was, you know, even at the beginning in my prediction was ranked as a 13th forward. Uh, you now see where Yamamoto has gone and how he's been able to apply some pressure. And so suddenly that right wing that looked like it was a bit of a wild card, probably a weakness on the team is now looking like a strength. Uh, you know, Raddy's leading the NHL in preseason scoring. He's got seven goals right now. Like, who saw that coming? Yeah. Um, and then you've got Toyarvi and you've got Yamamoto with four goals each. So that right wing has seemed, seemingly tried to sort itself out here where it went looking like it was going to be Raddy, Reader, Toyarvi, and Cassian. To now it looks like it's going to be Raddy with a flip flop of either Yamamoto and Toyarvi. And then casting it on the fourth, and then Reader sliding back over to the left side. Uh, you look at the way that the lineup is now flowing. It's a very, it's a much faster team. They're playing much more up tempo, uh, and they're a little bit more urgency in their game this year. And I think that having a faster Yamamoto, a Poyarvi, who seemingly like overhauled his skating in the summer, no. and then you've got Ratty that's just starting to look like he's really taken it to heart that what they told him and you know you're getting an opportunity with the best player in the world there's 31 top line jobs in the nhl but there's only one with Connor mcdavid and so you look at the training that he went through over the summer and all the praise that he's getting from uh shirelli from mcclellan who's been very open and and actually talked extensively about ratty yesterday in his uh, post-game interview after ratty scored the hat trick um you now look at that line and you're like, okay, well, you know, maybe there's something here that can actually carry over into the regular season. Uh, So more so it's the offensive lines that have changed. Um, The question now becomes, you know, who is the best fit for dry sidle right now as the, as the second line right wing, do you want to go with boy RV who, you know, he's kind of driving that third line right now with Kara Strom and play RV all together. Uh, he is driving that line, and so you know you look at the defensive matchups and whatnot, and he's he's thriving right now. Uh, do you want to maybe move him up with Dry Saddle just for a game or two, just so we can get a look to see how well they match up? Because it it looked at times yesterday when you had Yamamoto lining up with Dry Saddle and Lucic that there just wasn't a whole lot going on there. Yeah, they um, didn't seem to have the chemistry. I thought. Yeah. No, it, it looked like it was just uh, you know. You watch some of the playback, and you watch where the wingers are floating around, and you see uh, like almost like a double cover where Yamamoto is going in one direction, and Lucic is just following along and kind of just trailing behind him. Mm-hmm. And they're they're going in the same similar paths. Um, but you know, from an offensive standpoint, it is it just didn't look like the mat- there was much of a match there. So I'd like to see what happens if you move Yamamoto down with Strom and uh, Kara, with a big guy that can move the puck, a guy that's you know, uh, whose job is just to kind of just focus. He needs a skill guy with him as well. And then, uh, you know, Yamamoto being the guy that's that's essentially driving that third line. Um, you know, maybe Paul Yarby is there just a little. He's maybe one step ahead of Yamamoto. Uh, so maybe you want to maybe try 
him with dry sidle just to see what happens here and just to see if we can maybe spark something on that second line yeah yeah so you know i i um and i had a chance you just released this article today i believe right for the depth chart or last night maybe yeah it was this morning yeah this morning uh, so I did have a look, uh, and I read the article, and, and for those of you, go to thehockeywriters.com and, and uh, check out Shane Sanders' articles, and, and you'll find it there. Um, and you'll see uh, it's uh, he's got his final prediction for the depth chart. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I do, um, I look at this, and I see uh, Pooley Arvey there on the, on the second line, and I and I know where you're going with that. And then I, um, and I would, last night I tweeted out that I thought, you know, here's a guy who, you know, we, we, those of us that, uh, you know, looked into his career and listened to everybody that knew him, um, you know, knew that he had the skill level to succeed in this game. Uh, he just had to find it. Uh, and then the other thing that I really loved about Pugliarvi is uh, his work ethic. I mean, he comes out to every single game, and, and uh, at least in this preseason, and has been the hardest working guy out there. You know, he's skating hard to every puck. He's, uh, you know, he looks like he is engaged and ready to play this game. Now, I would, I said in that same tweet, I said, well, you know, it'd be nice to see him uh, spend some time on Dreisaitl's line. And, uh, you know, I started listening to some of our, you know, uh, Staples and McCurdy and, and listen to Stoffer all the time and listen to these guys. And they brought up, uh, Stoffer brought up a point the other day, which was, it's time for Pugliarvi to drive his own line. And just as to your point, right, like he, he's driving that third line and, and, uh, and he's been producing in preseason. We'll see how that relates uh, when, when the regular season starts. But it may be that that uh, third line for him is is the place for him. Drysaddle's got to own a line, right? And um, he certainly looked at times frustrated last night. Uh, Staples and McCurdy seemed to think that he was playing at about seventy-five percent. I just thought he he looked off altogether. I mean, he's throwing it out into the middle a couple of times where nobody there. It wasn't typical Drysaddle. Uh, I I believe he'll he'll get out of that. But my concern is, you know, if you put him on uh, Pugliarvi on that line, and I and I would like to see him take a take a run at it. But if you put the two of them together, then, you know, is your third line strong enough? And uh, to have three lines rolling with, uh, I mean, that first line, if they're anything like they're looking in preseason, uh, you know, I like I. I Try not to get too excited about it, right? Because it seems like Ratty, everything he's touching uh, goes in the net. And, uh, you know, both McDavid and, and Nugent Hopkins seem to have a certain confidence in him. And, you know, we're going to talk too much about that because uh, as the season progresses, uh, we're going to see what, you know, if that really relates in the regular season, I, I sure hope so. I mean, McDavid's, uh, of course, he's going to, you know, do wonderful things. I hope Raddy's the guy to do that with him. What's what's your thought, though? I mean, do you really think you put um, – and Yamamoto, is he for real, right? Is he is he going to stay the season? Uh, he really sort of – he's really sort of misplaced Kajula, I think, in terms of the lineup, right? Like there's – ceases to be as much room for Kajula in this lineup if he doesn't uh, pick up his game. Well, um, yeah. I, I agree with you on this aspect that you want to have three lines going with McDavid, Drysaddle, and Poyarvi. I would just like to see in the next preseason game if how well Yamamoto can go and how well he can drive a line himself. Because at the end of the day, you know, you got these three guys that are pretty much your building blocks up front, and you're you got to get all those lines rolling. Whether or not Yamamoto can pull his weight and be the guy to truly drive that third line, there remains to be seen. Uh, if you want to go in that aspect where you want three guys that are that are the guys, then you have to go McDavid, Drysaddle, and Poyarvi on three separate lines. Uh, I think that. Poyarvi or Yamamoto, whoever ends up on that third line spot is really going to benefit from those defensive matchups. Yeah. And that's going to allow them to have that opened up 
space because they're you know they're pretty much gonna be going around second or third line defense pairings. Uh, with Yamamoto, you know, having Kara and Strom there, Kara really opens up a lot of space for everybody that he's played with. And I think that he's been one of Edmonton's best forwards in the preseason right now. He looks like he's ready to go. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to just see what happens here in the next game or two to see how well Poyarvi can go and drive his own his own line versus what you can do with Yamamoto because we haven't exactly seen that sample size yet outside of when you know you had Yamamoto on the line with the two other kids of Benson and uh, and McLeod. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens here in the next little while. Can this carry over into the regular season? I hope it does because without scoring from the right side here th- this team's in trouble uh you saw what happened last year when they didn't have scoring from the from their secondary guys and we've seen exactly in the past when this team goes cold uh if you don't have everybody all hands on deck you're just gonna flounder right yeah. so if they want to take that uptick and improve their offense and make that one extra step forward that's gonna boost them into the playoffs you need those guys to score we're not saying that everybody needs to be a 20 goal scorer but you know, between three of them, if they can get, if at least one of them can hit the twenty goal mark, and then you can get the other two around the fifteen goal mark, I think you're, I think you're looking okay. So we'll see what happens over the regular season. You know, as, like we said earlier, you never know until the games are played. So this uh, dry side of Lucic thing, uh, you know, are you, you know, as a as somebody like me, we watch the games. What's your thought on that? I mean, I I put out. Uh, my own sort of idea as to what I'd like to see the lineups come opening day. I actually, I had Pooley RV up on, uh, on the second line with dry um, and I, and I put Yamamoto actually on the left wing. Uh, we saw him on the left wing, uh, in that Winnipeg game and he did quite fine. And then I, uh, had Lucic on the third line, uh, with, uh, Strom and, um, and Reader, uh, on the third line. And then I, I'm trying to remember now who I had. Um, again, I think uh, Kajula I, I left uh, left out of the lineup uh, as well for opening day. Um, yeah, but, he's in trouble right now. Oh, uh, for I'll sure. tell you that. Yeah. Like, yeah. if he get if he starts the year as a 13th forward, and you see Raddy play RV and Yamamoto really take off, Kara really cementing himself and Reader cementing himself in the bottom six. Do you really want to be paying someone one point five million to sit on the bench? Yeah, you know, I think yeah. he's he becomes a if if he starts the year as a thirteen forward, I think you start only to see those straight flags come up. Same with Auberg as well, because you know, do do they waive him? Do they do they keep him as the fourteenth forward, or you know, do they try risking to send seeing if they can sneak him down into Bakersfield when they have to put him on waivers and see if maybe they can keep him while he's down there and. You know, maybe he needs to, he just needs some more time to develop. So, yeah. I'll tell you one thing was nice was uh, Cassian last night. I, I liked his game last night. Uh, he was engaged. He was doing all the things that make Cassian good uh, without all the things that make him bad. He went after Goodbrinson at, uh, after that hit on uh, Chase On. Uh, that's another guy who I thought actually had a good game last night was Chase On. Yeah, I think last night that was probably Cassian and Chason's best preseason game. Yeah, Cassian by a by a long mile, that was his best. So, so we we're, we're spending a ton of time talking about the forwards and that, and you know with when you got Connor McDavid and Leon Drysaitel and Pooley RV on your team, sometimes we focus on that. Uh, lots has been talked about in terms of the defense this uh, this season. Uh, some people are. Um, apocalyptic about it uh some people you know are excited about it where do you sit and uh especially after last game the last couple games uh you've got right now uh really it's the third pairing that is uh the question mark right now you've got chris russell and evan bouchard do you think bouchard's going to be more than nine games i think he's going to stay uh the reason why is i think that when he's moving the puck, he's he's years ahead of where he's supposed to be for an 18 year old. Uh, more often than not, you know, there's there's that adjustment. Like we all need to factor for the uh, for the fact that he's 18. He's never played NHL hockey, so we're gonna have to see where he does with these nine games. But 
with where he's gone right now, he's making smart decisions with the puck. He's making that first outlet pass out of the zone. And that's something that this team struggles with is year after year, you watch this team try to break out of their own zone and they can't break out. It's that first pass that gets them in trouble almost all the time because it's just it's going in the wrong in the wrong areas. It's not going anyone where there's any real puck support for like a one touch pass that's going to get the second forward to carry the puck up after he gets it from the first one. And you see the way that Bouchard just quickly moves the puck and how just he takes that second to just take a quick look, but it's off his stick as quickly he can get it. That's a benefit. That's something that this team doesn't really have, um, and he's able to provide that uh with the power play you know, there's going to be cleft bombs on the first one with the four with the four other forwards and then you've got nurse benning and bouchard that can all maybe factor into that second power play unit so i think as the season progresses we'll see the three of them rotating in and out on the defense there uh so if he could get power play time and he's protected at five on five and he's insulated by a veteran you know say what you will about chris russell some people call him a starfish some people think that he's actually a good defenseman. Yeah, I think having Russell do the best things that Russell can do off the glass and out, very simple one-touch passes, and just kind of leave the puck-moving aspect of things to Bouchard and just more so just covering up and watching for him, I think that you can actually insulate Bouchard quite well. Uh, now, on his own, he's got to show on his own merits that he actually belongs here, right? You can't just have someone here that's, you know, just being coddled along the whole way. You know, you, you don't want to see how much he can progress forward, and you need to actually test him with that power play time. But, you know, like if, you, if you're expecting this guy to pay, play 24 minutes plus, you know, I don't think anybody's expecting that right out of the gate. And I don't think that he has to play 20 minutes a game to be a success this year. If you play him in the range of 17 to 19 minutes per game, more so probably about 18, call it down the middle. If he plays about 18 minutes a night and he's able to provide good quality ice time at that 18 minutes, I think it's a successful season. It's not just about points this year for Bouchard. It's about making that adjustment and getting to that pro level. He's a better skater than I than uh, a lot of folks were anticipating as well. Uh that shot that he's got, it almost looks effortless. You you see him just yeah. like because he's got a very he's got a very like uh, like upright posture and stance when he's on the ice. So it doesn't look like he's moving much, but uh, or he you know he looks like he's half asleep. But as soon as he gets the puck, I've never seen someone that just looks like they're just you know going through the motions and just firing it on net. But that puck comes off his stick pretty hard. Yeah, he's uh, he's got a, a hell of a shot and. Um... Yeah, you're right. It's um, and it's a little bit sneaky, right? It seems to get through uh, most of the time, and um, you know, it's not it's not a surprise watching him play uh, that he's done you know as well as he has in junior. Um, and he's smart yeah. with his shot selection too. Yeah. If you watch like if you watch the footage back of the game against Vancouver, and then one of the other ones earlier in the week, you watch every time he gets the puck, he's not just hammering it on net just for the sake of hammering it on net. He's throwing pucks low. And so he can, which is a veteran thing. You don't really see a lot of the young defensemen do that where they'll start, you know, they get the puck and they just hammer it on net because they think that like, I have had the puck, I need to score. I have the puck, I need to score. Get the puck, shoot it on net, try to score. Bouchard yeah. is more so just, he gets the puck, he looks up at his options, takes a, shoots it on net, but he keeps it low, waits for that deflection, waits for a rebound to kind of develop out front. And you watch... What happens when he shoots it, you're getting a lot of skirmishes out in front of the net. And that's because he's he knows that. It's it's one of those things where, you know, it's it's a it's a play where he's doing this above where he's supposed to be doing. So he's starting he's taking the game at a more of a veteran level than someone that's an eighteen year old that's coming fresh out of junior. Uh, so I think he's gonna be all right. I know I know that people are saying that without Sakara that this defense is doomed. But you have to remember is that when Sakara came back last year, he was playing as a number five, six D yeah. more often than not. He was a six D. He was only playing about 16 to 17 minutes a night. He was very seldomly used on the power play, very seldomly used on the PK. And he was a shell of him, uh, of shell of his former self. If you get insert Bouchard in there, I think you can get more quality power play minutes than what you're getting with Sakara last year. So, you know, take one versus the other. You know, having Bouchard come in here, it does help the back end. I don't think it's as bad as the people think, 
I, I'm more so concerned about the top four of how that's going to meld along because that's the bread and butter of this team. Clefbaum needs to stay healthy. Larson needs to stay healthy. You need Nurse to take another progression step forward in his offense. And you need Benning to kind of consistently give you what he gave you last year, if not a little bit of an uptake forward. Those are the four that are going to make or break your defense. It's not going to be Evan Bouchard or Chris Russell that are going to sink you. It's going to be the top four. Yeah. So, I, you know, my feeling on it is this. I, uh, A, I'll, I'll put this right out there. I, uh, I'm not big on Matt Benning. Not, not. Uh, I wasn't at the end of last season. Uh, I was surprised uh, to have him around this season. We'll see if he, um, you know, I, I want him to surprise me uh, and uh, have a good season. We've got him, of course, second pairing. Everybody's got him second pairing, uh, and I'm just not. I'm just not a big Matt Benning fan. Most people, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, folks out there. Uh, you know, fancy stats or whatever. They just don't like Chris Russell, right? Uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm a fan of Chris Russell. I think he's, you know, a veteran of the game. You know, he, he goes out there and he works hard every night. Uh, I like him. I, I, um, so I, I, my sort of my top four, not in how they line up, because uh, I, I certainly wouldn't put Russell on the second pairing. But my top four are uh, Clefbaum, Larson, Nurse, and Russell. And then I've got a ton of question marks. Uh, Jacob Jerebic, I was a little bit surprised today to read that um, McClellan uh, indicated that he felt like Jerebic was getting better uh, game after game. I uh, Last night he gave the puck away, led to a Pugliarvi penalty at one point. Uh, you know, he, like he just... To me, I don't know if he, like, if it's nerves or what it is, but, uh, you know, and... and you know, the thing that we don't see is what's happening in practice every day. Uh, so, you know, I don't know, you know, if, if he's from from my vantage point game situation. I didn't think he got he's been any better game after game, but they're certainly giving him a chance to succeed, at least on this team. Uh yeah, I'm worried about Matt Benning. I am worried a little bit about Bouchard in the in the defensive aspect of his game. I think, you know, you're right. Skating, offensive ability, great. You know, sheltered minutes, great. Uh, but what I do worry about is that, um, you know, you're going to get caught out there against the good players. And uh, and if you're Bouchard and you get caught, you know, uh, a, a few times and you, and you get made to be, you know, uh, look silly on defense, how does that affect your, um, how does that affect your confidence as a young player? Uh, I, I believe the sky's the limit for Bouchard. Like I, there's no doubt in my mind that he has the talent to be a, um, you know, a, a star defenseman, offensive defenseman. He's, and, and I think the defensive, um, lapses that he, that he has can be worked on. And I think he can get better at that position for sure defensively. Uh, but I really, I really worry about him uh, going full into the season uh, and uh, how that affects his confidence if he gets beat um, a number of times. Jerebic again, by the way, last night uh, just about got beat on the outside, uh, just inside the blue line. Um, you know, I, I was excited when they grabbed him. I thought uh, I watched uh, a number of clips. I, you know, I talked to, um, you know, one of uh, Sport Major. He's on Twitter. Uh, a big Capitals fan, uh, you know, I, I, you know, saw some of his numbers, looked at his stats. I thought uh, that's a good signing for a, you know, six, seven guy. Um, but I've, I've really been disappointed. And uh, McClellan clearly thinks that he's got something with Jerebic or, you know, he wouldn't keep him around. Uh, but I, so my, my concern on the um, defense uh, runs, you know, five, six, on I do I still think we need somebody to replace uh, Sekera, Clefbaum uh, and Larson. By the way, I thought I thought they had a little trouble moving the puck last night, but I you know I got out of them like as a fan I got out of them what I wanted to see, which was you know solid, hard to play against. Um, but last night there were stretches where Vancouver dominated, and. That's not an offensive thing. We we clearly had no offensive problem last night, 
good to see Talbot seems to be limber and back and and focused and tracking the puck. But uh, defensively, I, man, I I just wasn't uh, overly impressed last night. Yeah, yeah, they they've got to get better in their own in their own end, and I think a lot of that comes out to the foot, to all this like puck support because. The problem over the last few years is that they're when they're trying to get out, and I have to say is that when I've I've been watching the Oilers consistently for almost 25 years now, and for the past 25 years that I've been watching and actually paying attention and actually able to anticipate what's going on here, I don't remember the last time that this club was actually able to successfully break out of their own zone. They've notoriously been bad coming out of their own zone. Uh, you watch, you watch how they move the puck up their the defense just hesitates to move it up and when they do move it up they're moving it into no man's land there's not a whole lot of let's let's get the puck let's carry it and there's not a whole lot of well i'm going to be the guy here that's going to find an outlet or you don't have the forwards coming down low enough you don't have another guy that's coming up behind him to actually support him when he gets the puck there's no strong side attack it's just it almost seems like there's just bodies just thrown out into the neutral zone on they're just hoping to get it up to someone. And they make the first pass, and that first pass guy looks up, and he's got no one coming around him. He's got a bunch of other jerseys around him, and he just ends up coughing the puck up or just trying to dump it, which results in another possession going back the other way. Um, going back to Jarabek, you know, I have to agree here. He's just, I haven't been overly thrilled with the way that he's played. Um, in that, that game against Vancouver, it was the first preseason game. When I was watching that one live, uh, they had Garrison, they had Jarabek, and uh, there was another defender that was playing that night, It's uh, or uh, Key and Lowe. The three of them were just horrendous that night. Uh, I thought that Garrison started, the, started off well, and then just as the game wore on, he just got slower, he got tired, he, was start, he started to make mental mistakes. And that's sort of been Garrison throughout camp. Is that he can he gets one really good period he gets one good period, and then it's kind of like a mediocre period, and then he has a bad period in, in whatever order that, that that it happens. But he always gives you one good period. Jarabek, it's just kind of just been okay. It's it, it's been okay, and it's been more so on the bad side. Uh, I, I find with him, it's the same thing that you said here. It's just it's more so moving the puck up the ice. He looks lost in his own end. Uh, he's he's not exactly playing up to the speed of where the game is going to be. He's playing at the speed that he operates at right now. So I'm a little concerned when the regular season comes around and say if there's an injury within the Edmonton's top six on defense, and you insert Jarrah back in. Like, is he going to be able to give you those quality minutes at 15, 16 minutes a night as a sixth defenseman? You know, I'm I'm a little concerned there. When you look at the numbers, it's and you look at the way that he's played. He falls very well within that realm of what we had with Oivitu, Anton Belov, Denis Grebyshkov uh, on his second go around with the club. I'm not overly expecting him to, you know, have an immediate benefit for the club. I think that he's going to struggle. But uh, I would have rather have seen them maybe go after some other guys. But, uh, you know, he's here now. Um, he's going to start the year here. It doesn't make sense to have... Uh, Ethan Bear play as the number seven. I know one scenario that was that was floated around was uh, having uh, Bouchard, Bear, and Jarabek rotate in and out of that number six spot uh, just for the first couple of games, and then eventually making a decision because uh, Bear doesn't actually require waivers to go back down. So yeah. you can keep him up here, and you go with two, eight, and thirteen. Um, but then you have to to do that. You would have to waive either. Auber or Kajula to go down to the farm. So it's a matter of how you want to move bodies around. Uh, Garrison, I'm still not sold that he's going to get a contract. I don't see him being an NHL option right now. Uh, you know, he he can he can be that number seven, but is you know it's almost like Jarabek's just got that one extra leg up on him. But uh, you know, Garrison, he's he's a little bit slower than what he used to be. He's a shallow of him former self. Uh, what I w- would be open to is maybe seeing if we can get Garrison signed to uh, to a deal that maybe uses them down in the minors because you you've got Bear Jones and Lodgison, pretty much your three big fixtures on the farm, and the only 
veteran that's down there is uh, Ryan Stanton. If you put Garrison down there, and we're not talking about putting Garrison into first power play, dice time, first penalty kill, and that, we're talking about having Garrison there in a player coach role. You know, he's got 538 NHL games under his belt. So the question now is, you know, is he willing to accept that that's where his career is at now, that he's, you know, an AHL player coach type? Or, you know, is he going to look at the fact that he's made $30 million in his career and say, you know what, I've had a good run and it's over? Because, you know, this is that guy the type of guy that wants to go down and play in the minors and ride the bus again? You know, I yeah. don't think so. Yeah, I, you know, I, the whole Garrison thing kind of confuses me just a little bit. Um, I, you know, I, I suspect there's more to it than what we, what we know. I mean, it just, it felt like a weird PTO from the start, uh, especially given the fact that we had uh, Gravel uh, in the lineup, and um, and that was peculiar for me to see Gravel go down. I thought he played pretty well. Yeah, before I, he went down, I were, I had him in the games that he played while he was here. I thought that he had the leg up on. Grab it on uh, Grabishkov. Yeah, uh, I think Jer- SPR said it best though. This was a, uh, I think with Gravel, uh, you know, Sean, um, who's uh, who does the uh, late night with the oil night. Uh, Sean said, uh, you know, it's it's likely a timing thing, and I and I believe that, uh, you know, send him down, uh, you know, while teams are still looking to see what they've got, um, and then uh, because you. You know, you know what you have in Gravel. You can call him up later, right? Um, I I think though, like I'm I'm just really confused. I I could see keeping Garrison around as a veteran presence during camp. You know, he's he's a guy that's been around. He's you know been a few places. Uh, maybe he you know uh, he can talk about what it was like to be in Vegas uh, uh, during that. And, and just the culture and, and uh, you know, let the guys know what I think. Like, I think this team needs a culture, right? A culture and, and to have a guy like that around, I don't think is a bad thing. I've heard him speak. I've heard him, you know, in, in interviews, he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's mature. He's, you know, he's a professional. Uh, so I think having him around is not a bad thing. I, I have heard that he uh, would like to play in Europe. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Um, but uh, you know, maybe maybe there is something there for him to go and play in the AHL. I don't think he's making the team. Uh, of course, I, I don't think you do either. Um, and he has been uh, he has been inconsistent. When he's on, he's on. He's great, right? Just like you said, he he had um, last night against Vancouver. He had some great plays. Uh, maybe his best game last night, but he still. You know, it wasn't a hundred percent. They just, uh, you know, he doesn't have quite the the same foot speed. He's, um, you know, uh, doesn't seem to, uh, uh, you know, just have have what he had, you know, five six years ago, or, or even less than that. Yeah. Um, but I, I I my feeling is is there's more to that PTO than than what we know. I mean, we know why they invited Upshaw. We know why you know. Uh, and that was a disappointment too. Was just, was you know, I, I really thought that Upshaw was going to be a difference maker. You yeah. saw how pumped up he was to play with Brodziak. Two of the two of them have been playing together with St. Louis for the past three years, yeah. and that's been one of the better penalty kills in the league. Um, you know, just to have that option on the fourth line to roll those two out and just say we need a dependable penalty kill, and have them play. You know, even though that they're a little bit older in the tooth now, but. Uh, to have those two on the yeah, as penalty killers, I thought it was going to be a great option, but you know it just wasn't meant to be. Um, just uh, just as we're going through the lineup here, uh, I just saw this is uh, Jack Michaels, uh, one of the broadcasters for the Oilers. He posted his at about six this morning for his potential lineup, and it's pretty much the same lineup that you and I are talking about right now, except he's got the team signing Chase on and Garrison to PTOs. Or oh, okay. for signing them off of their PTOs and having them here. So I'm assuming that he's got Jarabek going down to the farm and he's got Auburn getting waived as well. So we'll see what happens. It's you know yeah. it, it looks like the roster is pretty much nearly set. What we're just now waiting on is just the minutia of, you know, or do we sign these guys off of their PTOs to, to deals or are we gonna let these guys go? So Yeah. We'll see what happens with the spare parts. Yeah, I thought um 
<laughs> you know, I think uh, Auberg, Aberg, I think he uh, he definitely, um, you know, is odd man out for sure. And and uh, I definitely take Chase on over him. Uh, Gullitson has experience with him, obviously, in Calgary. Um, I see, uh, I'm just looking at uh, Michael's lineup here. He's got Kajula in there. Uh, I think Kajula, I mean, we talked about that earlier. He's got reason to be worried. Um, and and I, you know, I, I'd probably take Garrison over Jerebic, too. Um, having him around uh, as uh, maybe some veteran support for Bouchard. And if some of those rumors are true about... Um, about uh, you know uh, Chirelli potentially having a deal in the mix for early season once they um, once they put uh, Sekera on long term injured reserve uh, yeah. maybe there's maybe there's something maybe that's you know you keep um, maybe that's the deal they had all along with um, Garrison was hey look like we think we got something in Bouchard and we need a veteran around to kind of coach him and be there with you and and uh you know we might not keep you all season but you know we'll pay you in the interim right yeah. i don't know i i just the garrison thing still obviously you can tell uh confuses me a little bit but yeah it's just but you know if, if you're gonna be playing and you, and you want that veteran to play uh or if you want that a guy to come in on a pinch hit uh i still think that jarabek probably gives you a little bit more in terms of puck moving uh, than Garrison does at this stage of his career. Um, and if we're talking about a guy that's going to be playing 82 games, you know, you're obviously going to, you know, with, with what shakes down here, it looks like Russell is the guy instead of Garrison. So you're going to have to have Garrison kind of flounder in and out, in and out as a number seven. I just don't think that he gives you enough as that seven, maybe as an eight, but uh, like someone that's, you know, ideally tweening up and down between the NHL and AHL. But um, I see Garrison as someone that could definitely help the kids down on the farm. I just don't see him being someone that at this stage and where he's at and where his play is at being someone that can be a, a regular NHL guy or even a seven right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and maybe their uh, intention is, um, you know, to have Bear and Garrison, right? If you have uh, Garrison, Bear and, and Bouchard, you know, Garrison as a veteran presence around those two guys as they go in and out. Maybe Garrison never sees a regular season game. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, mean, I You know, I see a guy like Garrison being, a, you know, a capable assistant uh, or uh, associate captain when he's uh, on the ice um, and uh, just being that veteran leader. But, um, yeah. Well, you know what? We're, uh, we're running down uh, to the bottom of the hour here uh let's uh any last thoughts as we uh go into this season what um i guess you know what we've seen from uh exhibition and training camp and all of these things uh are you more optimistic uh you know what how do you feel about this team as we uh head into the season and what does the um european trip mean um well, I think where I am right now, I'm a little, I am a little bit more optimistic, just because of the fact that that right wing depth is now tar- is now providing you with some scoring. Whereas, you know, they're a big wild card, and it's it's now is will this translate into the regular season? And that'll be the that'll be the storyline to watch as we go through September or we go through uh, October here. Um, now, relating this to the Pacific Division, because you have to now look at this as we got to get out of the microcosm of Edmonton and now look at the Pacific as a whole to see where this team really is. So you, I, I think it's a foregone conclusion with everybody that uh, San Jose seems to be like the obvious choice to win the division this year. Would, would you agree? Yeah, I, uh, not much argument there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least initially. Yeah, they they've got the best defense in in the league right now. You know, being able to roll out. Carlson, Burns, and Vlasic potentially on three different pairings to start yeah. the year, you know. And then you've got Vegas is, you know, you're hoping that they'll, you know, last year wasn't a fluke. You know, they did get a lot of bounces. Fleury's a little bit older. You did get a lot of miracle stories last year. Uh, but, you know, if Marcus Carlson and Smith and, you know, like uh, Alex Tuck can kind of come back together and, and provide that scoring and then you get – 
Stastny and Pacioretty to to come in and and be forces for them. You know, that's that's a pretty decent lineup. It's an underrated blue line. They're very mobile. Uh, everybody buys into the system, and if they do the same things that they did last year, and they listen to Gallant, and they just follow the direction of what they're given and play within that system, I don't think that they can. I think that they'll definitely finish in the top two of the division. And then after that, you know, I know I'll probably get some groans here, but uh, I've got Calgary third, and then uh, I've got LA fourth. So just based off of the moves that Calgary made, I think that they're a little bit better. They're stronger. They're stronger down the middle. They now have the ability to roll at least three lines, maybe four lines offensively. Uh, they're, they've always been deep on defense, maybe a little bit overrated versus what they actually look like on paper versus what they deliver. Um, but health is going to be a key thing for Calgary. So if Calgary can stay healthy, I think that they're going to be a top three uh, team in the division. And then you get down to where Edmonton kind of sits. So within that range where it's Calgary, L.A., Anaheim, and themselves – uh, you look at Kovalchuk, the big question with him was, is Kovalchuk going to be the same guy that he was when he left? And if you look at his NHL equivalent for his points from the KHL translating last year into the NHL, it was still a 78-point season. Uh, so as long as they have Quick, they've got Dowdy as the linchpins on the back end, and you've got Kopitar, Kovalchuk, if Brown can even score 20 goals again, and you've know, always got Jeff Carter there, that's going to be a dangerous team as well. Uh, their offense improved last year, and with getting an injection of Kovalchuk, I think they can go better than just being the average team offensively, and they might be able to get a little bit more under John Stevens. And then that throws Edmonton right in that mix with Anaheim, right? Uh, Anaheim now, you know, uh, Corey Perry's going to be out for five months after having knee surgery, yeah. so that's a little bit of a hit up front. Health has already been an issue for them. They're already missing Kessler. Uh, Patrick Eves was a little bit shaken up over the summer. Uh, but the defense is still pretty good under Fowler, Lindholm, Manson, and Montour as your top four. It's a very mobile group. You've got Gibson who can get really, really hot at times. And so though that team is a complete wild card and what will happen there. But I just I don't know if with that team getting as older as they are and just where they're at these days, you know, six straight years in the playoffs and now, and then, you know, five straight 100-point seasons. I think this is the year that they take a bit of a step back. Uh, so I've got Edmonton just kind of right above Anaheim right now. And obviously I've got Arizona and Vancouver finishing seven and eight. So for this to be something where Edmonton pulls forward and gets into the playoffs, they need to be out playing those teams like Calgary, L.A., and Anaheim because that's the group that they're in right now. And that's the group that they've got out play to get into the playoffs. Uh Health was an issue last year with this team. Now that they're healthy, they're, there's no one that they're missing significantly outside of Sakara. And I'll even underline that because, you know, he was a 5-6 defenseman last year, and he is starting to show signs of regression even before we found out that he was going to be missing most of the year with that uh, with that ankle injury. So, yeah. you know, Edmonton, you know, it's I'm definitely more optimistic. The team is definitely playing more up-tempo, more puck possession style. They're quicker, they're faster, they're more assertive on the ice. Uh, but, you know, this is preseason. You have to, This has to carry over into the regular season, you know, because last year they were they were one of the best teams in preseason as well, right? So, But the Stanley Cup is rewarded in September. It's rewarded in uh, June. So we'll see what happens here. Yeah. Yeah, I don't uh, – I think, uh, you know, you've you touched on a number of things there. And, uh, you know, and where we are in the Pacific Division is obviously key. Uh, I'm, I, I, um, I'm not big on Calgary. It, it's maybe the homer in me, but um, I, I just don't believe in, uh, in some of the moves that they made. I think, you know, it's hard for me to believe that their defense got better by, uh, you know, getting rid of Hamilton. Uh, despite what it provided in the room, and then I, I'm just not a, I just don't think uh, Smith will do it for them in in net. But um, you know, I like in terms of lasting the whole season, uh, and uh, you know, I, if, if Kachuk stays healthy, because uh, he once he left last year, that's when they really went for their tailspin. But I, I, I just don't think that they've um, they've got it. So I, obviously San Jose uh, number one, Vegas. I'm really curious about. Right. I mean, they, um, you know, the thing is, when you have success like that, uh, and uh, if you listen to uh, Elliot Friedman on 31 Thoughts, 
he talked about, you know, he's reading a book. Um, yeah, it's an NFL coach. I can't remember which one. And he's he's talking about the it, you know, a team having the it factor and, and um, putting stuff together. And, and Vegas had that last year, but they've changed now. They don't have Neil anymore. They don't have, uh, you know, our good friend Perron. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, it's not going to be the same team and they're not going to be, they're going to have different expectations. Does the same thing happen that happened to Edmonton? We'll see. I, I kind of see, so how I see the Pacific for me right now is San Jose. And then, you know, there's a whole bunch of people who are going to be fighting for that, uh, middle ground, uh, and all pretty, uh, pretty close in my mind, I think. The Oilers, uh, if they can get, and last night, oh man, their power play just couldn't get it going. Uh, but if they can get the power play going, uh, I think our, our penalty kill is just automatically going to be better if we have better goaltending this year, more consistent goaltending. Um, well, I think I, an uh, underrated thing that we're not going to be talking enough about right now that was going to become a storyline as the year goes on is the hiring of Trenioni. Because he was in Anaheim, and when he was in Anaheim for the past four or five years that he was there they were a top five uh pk team i think that they were um when i ran the stats they were actually second best pk over the over his entire run as assistant coach that was you know handling their pk so if he can do what he did with uh with the youngsters there with the and tr that translates to the defense in edmonton i think that that naturally the defense is going to get better and the penalty kill on itself you watch it through the preseason, it looks like they're a lot more organized. There's not a whole lot of running around. It's a lot more structured. Yeah. So I think under Yanni, that's going to be something that should improve as the year goes on. Absolutely. So, Shane, i got to uh, call it uh, for today. Uh, again, I'm just going to put a little plug out there for the uh, Oilers Live Cup, December 9th. Uh, go register. Follow me on Twitter at Oilers Live. Please, please, please subscribe wherever you get podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, uh, Stitcher, um, Spotify, I'm everywhere, SoundCloud, uh, SoundCloud. Uh, and then uh, please go to the YouTube channel and subscribe there. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, when you're done all of that, um, go check out the Hockey Writers because we've got Shane Sander and now uh, Eric Friesen's joining you at the Hockey Writers and he's a regular guest uh, and um, you know, a really good, uh, good guest to have on the show. Uh, thanks so much again, Shane. Have uh, have a great week, uh, and I'll get you on uh, hopefully a couple more times during the year. Yeah, it was fun. Hope to see you do it again. Excellent. And that's From it. From Session Heavy 204, Hockey Podcast. Thanks Heavy everybody. Hockey Podcast with Michael and guests. Heavy Hockey isn't dead. It's just getting started.